Hello, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, this, which is not really the first, actually the second in a series of uh, or parent uh, information sessions. Um, uh, I saw lots of you on the Zoom call with Lorraine Lee earlier in the week, um, and you'll see a lot more of that uh, coming uh, from Embley over a few weeks, months, and across the rest of this year. The focus really is, is about how we build that authentic partnership between home and school. Uh, you will, of course, have seen, you might even have read uh, about some of the uh, academic successes that we've had. Um, we've had uh, several articles published in the Times Educational Supplement, um, last year's, uh, and I mean this year's academic achievement has been leading. So there are very few schools in United Learning that can actually come close to where we are. Uh, last year, we were uh, nationally ranked in the top 1% for schools because of our, our A-level results. Um, but I always make a point of saying that it's, we're not just about results. The, you know, it, 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 Embley is a lot more uh, than just the results the children get. We're about the formation of individuals. But to be fair, that said, our core business is teaching and learning and the education children and introducing them concepts and uh, in getting them to to think uh, strategically and abstractly uh, and analytically. So the purpose of this evening uh, is to launch the series of these talks by looking at exactly exactly that. Now it's a little bit unusual for us to get underneath the the skin of what we do. You'll hear a lot about the pedagogy that we engage with. Uh, I don't make any apology for any of the technical pieces of work that you're going to see. Um, I think the, the focus on what we're at is so successful. It has been over the past three years, moving us very, very significantly from where we were three years ago to a position where we're about 130 or so places above the next independent school uh, in, in, the, in the region. So how do we do it? Well, working forensically on marginal gains, very, very sophisticated back office function uh, that crunches data and maps areas for challenge and support and so forth. But like I said, we're not creating disembodied minds. We're creating children capable of making a difference in the world. Uh, and that all roundedness to the education we provide is core uh, to what Emily is about. You see, it's not true. You actually can have your cake and eat it. A genuine, authentic school has children who run around, who sail, who get involved in ape drama productions, who do all of the music in the world, who play an instrument, who get involved with teams and are involved in hockey and netball and rugby and so forth, while also performing brilliantly academically. So I'm going to start a little in, in, in a second with handing over to Jose, who will take you through uh, the approach in the senior school before Miss Wright uh, picks up and unpacks some of the work that we're doing in the prep. The recipe is similar, uh, if slightly differently applied. So that's a sense of you know what we're going to be covering over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, it's a rare view, a look underneath the bonnet, as it were, of the engine that actually drives the academic performance at assembly. Um, I put it in front of you because we really, really want you to engage with that. We want you to engage with teaching staff. We want you to engage with understanding pedagogy and how we go about our business. It's unusual. It's not the norm, but not very much about how Emily goes about its business is the norm. Yeah. Jose, I think we'll start with you. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Canning. Thank you and welcome to, to, to this Meet the Head evening with a focus on learning to achieve. Um, as Mr. Canning said, my colleague Shana Wright will, will talk about the prep school shortly, but first let me take you through what learning to achieve means in the senior school. So what I aim to achieve in this presentation is um, uh, to show you our unrelenting focus on improving teaching and learning, the importance of a digital strategy, generally speaking, but especially in times of coronavirus, and how we track students to ensure that they are always performing to the best of their ability. So my presentation should be coming up on the screen for you. And I'd like to start by just acknowledging that Embley has come a long way in a relatively short time. Our focus on quality of teaching and learning has led us to year-on-year -year improvements in external examinations in both GCSE and A-level. Like Mr. Canning just said, we were in the top 1% of um, A-level results last year. And none of this happens by accident. On screen, you will be able to see some of the initiatives um, and interventions that we have put in place over the past um, three years or so to raise standards 
and embed best practice in teaching and learning. Many of these initiatives and interventions, like the tracking of the progress an individual student, uh, an individual student makes, um, or a focus on implementing educational research informed practice, uh, for example, all of this happens discreetly as a back office function. So you might not be aware of um, quite a lot of this happening. Well, hopefully you'll be better aware of it after this presentation. Um, other initiatives are much more visible, like our digital strategy, and I will also talk about that uh, in more detail in a minute. Um, um, or the annual teaching and learning conference that we set up uh, three years ago, which um, attracts high caliber speakers and teacher delegates from um, all over the country. At Embley, we are keenly aware of the need of continuing uh, professional development, not because the teaching is not up to scratch, but because everyone's practice can always improve. Uh, we therefore follow and in fact are active participants in the national debate on education. Our work and contributions have featured in the Times Educational Supplement, like Mr. Cannon said uh, uh, just a few seconds ago, and um, actually our resources feature in the Charter College of Teaching Resources as well, among other places. At both the micro and the macro level, all our initiatives and interventions and down to lesson planning and reporting, all of this is based um, on a combination of practical classroom pra experience, pedagogical expertise and educational research, such as that which you can see summarised on the screen at the moment. There is extensive research, often untapped, about how uh, we can check student understanding um, how we can scaffold difficult tasks in a lesson, um, how we can best, best guide uh, student practice. All of, this is, all, all of this has been extensively researched and what we are making sure is that we are plugged to this knowledge base, not just for the benefits of, us, of our teachers, but ultimately for the benefit of our students and their achievement. But arguably, the most important aspect of all um, is what happens in the learners' heads. This is why we also rely on what cognitive psychology, which is the science of learning, what cognitive psychology tells us about how students learn best. Not only so that we teachers are aware of this, but so that we can pass this knowledge on to students, so that in turn they are able to better plan and self-regulate their own learning. So for example, every year at tutor time and during assemblies, we share these strategies from cognitive psychology with our students. But we also make parents aware of them um, in, in curriculum evenings and information evenings so that they are better able to help their son or daughter at home. So, for example, when I was a student, I, I, I had terrible learning habits. I wasn't aware of the, 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 the strategies I could adopt to make my learning easier. So we are making sure that our students know about retrieval practice and the testing effect and how testing, uh, um, how testing themselves frequently will help them learn. Um, we'll learn about dual coding, so how you're better able to retain information if you um, access that information visually and through and uh, through audio channels as well. So this this is what we teach our students in addition to learning about maths, physics, and 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 and, and Spanish or geography. So not only do we teach them subjects, we also teach them how to best learn those subjects. The tracking of what progress student make, students make is of paramount importance to us. Um, this is one of those back, back office functions of which I spoke earlier. In addition to the granular day to day tracking that all departments and all teachers carry out, every half term the school performs a whole school tracking exercise that allows to see the progress individual pupils make in context. So on screen is a screen grab of our swarms tracking system, which is something we have developed here at Embley. Um, in it, you can see the progress that one individual year nine pupil has made over time and across subjects. So you will see the subjects on the left hand side and then you will see little swarms. This is where the name swarms come from. The blue dot is everybody else in the cohort and the yellow dot represents where the student is at that particular point in time in the cohort. So it will tell us whether the student is at the top, um, whether they're in the middle, um, or whether they're actually not doing well in that subject compared to the cohort. On the left hand side, where you see the column that's labeled Yellis prediction, that's baseline data. So all our students will um, will make uh, um, um, will take a test, at the, typically at the beginning of year seven, or if they join us 
in year nine at the beginning of year nine that that test and um, it's a psychometric test and it's organized by the university of durham many many schools in the country use it and what it does is that gives us a baseline it makes a prediction of what a student might able might be able to attain um, at, um, at GCSE. So as you can see on the left hand side, we have the yearly predictions for the different subjects. And at the end on the right hand side, you see what the student, the student actually attained um, at the end um, of the year. So um, as you can see, this particular student is doing a lot better than he would have done otherwise. And this is very often how we measure um, our, um, our, our success. What does this allow us to do? Well, this allows us to, to ask lots, lots of questions. So if a student is doing well in the sciences, but not in the um, humanities, this will come across. If a student is doing well in one of the sciences, but not the other, then we can begin to ask questions. Why is, it, why is this happening? We can, all, all our teachers have visibility of this. So we can talk to each other about what the progr what progress the student, the student is making. And of course, um, how we talk to each other is really, really important. So notice it's not just about how we teachers talk to um, ourselves about what progress we're making, but we're very much re remain in contact through our tutors and heads of section with, with parents. So we make sure that whenever the, an issue arises, um, either positive or negative, that parents uh, know about this immediately. At the back of many minds is probably the worry about lost curriculum time during the threat of um, of, of lockdown um, and what happened during the half term during the the, the, the previous lockdown. Um, so I am believe we're very very confident that our, our students never lost any any content. Um, uh, people joke about the school the school closing down and actually Emily never closed down. We just pivoted to to remote learning um, almost immediately. Uh, well, immediately the day after. Um, we locked down, we were doing lessons online following the school timetable. So when the government mandated lockdown uh, was implemented in March, we were able to pivot, pivot seamlessly to, to this um, uh, remote learning. And we came up with, a, with what I would say, and I, I am biased, uh, but I am aware of what the schools have what other schools have been able to put together. And I think we came up with a best in class response to, to, to the coronavirus emergency. Um, so we were able to teach remotely as students never lost any time. Should it be required, we stand ready to revert to remote learning um, um, if, if there is a further lockdown. We sincerely hope there isn't. Uh, but if there is a further lockdown, none of our students will be affected in adversely by, by, by lost curriculum time because there won't be any. We will just we will just do the remote learning. So this digital strategy was in place before lockdown, before coronavirus. And in, in, on, on the screen, you can see um, a summary of the main parts, the three component parts of our uh, digital, uh, of our digital learning strategy, the learning spaces, Spark Share and Office 365. Now, what I like to do is I like to just mention the digital learning spaces, which is the picture you can see on the right. So this is a bespoke set of resources that we have put together uh, for our students in every subject. So all Embley students will have access to, a to the digital learning space um, and then they can go into the granular of every subject and every year group and every topic that they are um, studying. So we think of this as the as the um, the um, the digital textbook. But another important aspect of our digital strategy is uh, SparkChat. And what I like to do is I like to show you um, how we um, use um, SparkChat and how that teacher that improvement in teacher and pupil interaction that was that feature in the first slide, how this actually takes place. And this is very important to us. Um, that you understand that we use SparkChat in addition to more traditional ways of communicating, not instead of, but rather in addition to. So our teachers are able to set tasks, receive work from students and feedback using this app that all our students have on their device. Um, so the app proved its worth well before coronavirus forced the lockdown on us back in March, but it really proved invaluable during, um, 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 during this time. And uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you some examples of what the app does and how our teachers use. So what you can see on screen, on screen is actually a video. So if I, if I get this video going, Well done, Eve. Thank you. Um, so lots of good stuff in here. The 
the bit where the three lenses pop down, that is called the objective lenses, um, but otherwise this is really good. So um, keep on going. It's great to see you make great progress. Hope you're doing okay at home and I'll speak to you later. So that was Mr. Lawson in science. If I go to another one now. Super work, Jack. Perfect quotations, lovely analysis, some really smart ideas. I'd like to see you trying to embed the context into them. Does Sheila here exemplify the 1912 woman or the 1945, or does she change as the text goes on? Very well done. So that was Miss Thomas there in an English lesson. Super work. Olivia, um, although penguins do eat fish, in this particular food web, there is no arrow going from the fish to the penguin. They're just showing that the penguin's eating squid. Um, so make sure that you read the questions ever so carefully and use the information that they've given you. And finally. Uh, hi, Amy. Yeah, this is very good. Very good indeed. Um, and you've you've really tackled with a very difficult issue at the end, OK? And you nearly get there with that last bit, and it's worth kind of pursuing a bit more. So yes, this idea of toying with the idea of tragedy, OK? So that will probably need a bit more explaining. I know what you want to say because we've discussed that, but with an examiner. So what, you're, what you need to kind of emphasize here is that in tragedy, it is inevitable, OK, that he will commit the crime. Uh, so as you can see, leaving comments in red ink at the bottom of a page in an exercise book is still an option for us but our students are more likely to hear the encouragement the kindness the belief in them and the support embedded in the voice of their teachers as they receive feedback for the work they produce and that takes me to the end of how we are learning to achieve in the senior school and i would like now to pass on the baton to my colleague sheena in the prep right thank you i think i think we're ready I'll just take a deep breath and continue um so um, back to where it all begins. So uh, my name's Shana Wright. I'm a head of prep at Embley. Um, and as I say, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, about wh where it begins and, and how our pupils start to learn to achieve. Um, so um, in front of you, you'll see um, Tom Sherrington's uh, clip, well, a, uh, a visual image from Tom Sherrington's The Learning Forest, which I think really demonstrates um, what that learning really looks like um, in prep. So it's all about establishing the conditions first. So um, to, to, um, to create that culture, the conditions to thrive, um, an approach which really embraces the joy of learning. So uh, in prep school, the joy has to come first. That's the most important thing. Um, but we also celebrate and don't shy away from excellence and we reward effort and also reward persistence. Um, and once those conditions are established, the rest can happen. Um, we follow a, a mastery curriculum approach, um, which is about a deep rooted knowledge. Um, it's built on firm foundations um, and that secure knowledge is really important and goes deeper rather than wider. Um, then we move on to, to learning in greater depth. So uh, where children start to connect ideas and broaden their experience and extend their capabilities. Thinking specifically about maths, when children have enough children have maths, um, and they um, move on to thinking about things in greater depth. It's about solving problems, those complex problems, um, and the way they approach them. So they, they're approaching them. Sometimes people don't realise with maths that you can be creative. So being creative and imaginative, turning things on their head, um, independently exploring and investigating. Um, and in English, um, the um, inference, for example, um, it might be an inference question that's, that's being um, responded to where clues are more subtle, so you can't instantly retrieve from the text or, or deduce. Um, so in, in year six, for example, you might um, come across a peel question um, where you have to answer by answering the point, so breaking down the question, finding that evidence from the text and then explaining the evidence. And then the L at the end is really important. And what really makes it greater depth is actually have you linked back to the question, but linked back to the context as well. Um, and literacy is everybody's responsibility. It impacts absolutely everything we do um, in prep school and all the subjects we teach. Uh, a love of reading, an ability to decode and comprehend um, can't be left to chance. So we have to plan for that really carefully. 
Um, our very youngest pupils um, are taught an engaging and systematic approach to phonics, but as I say, it has to be systematic and we have to build those early skills of, of, of reading. Um, and through this approach, um, children become more fluent um, and more accurate with good reading comprehension. Um, and they also learn to, to form, form letters, spell correctly and compose those ideas step by step. Our reading scheme in Key Stage 1 is, is a banded approach. So we use Colin's Big Cat uh, from the start of the children's reading journey right through to the end um, of Key Stage 1 at the end of year two. And we've just invested in an online version of that as well. So we now have a digital library for children all the way through prep um, with year uh, three to six using a, a different version, but uh, which has access to 5,000 fiction and non-fiction books. Um, in Key Stage 2, uh, so years three to six, we use Accelerated Reader, um, which is a way of children independently choosing books, um, but they do quizzes at the end just to make sure that they're choosing at the right level so that they're progressing well, but they've got that independence to, um, to choose, choose books that they, they love the look of and they want to, want to read. In maths, um, we use the most up-to-date and research-driven approaches. Um, maths mastery is about that core knowledge, that number is really, really important. Um, and many of our resources and our ideas come from the National Centre for Excellence in the Teaching of Mathematics. And we use that from years one to six, um, which includes uh, mastering greater depth um, questions which differentiate and help us with stretch and challenge. That stretch and challenge um, comes in the shape also of maths masterclasses, which, which take place in the senior school, national competitions are entered, um, times table leaderboard adds an element of competition and stock market investment club is an exciting crossover with senior school as well which happened this evening. Um, Maths mastery also uh, includes the following approach so you have reflecting, representing and reporting. So the children need that time so reflecting to reflect on, on experience and deepening that knowledge and understanding, pausing and pondering, um, not being rushed or pressured. So slowing that down and so that really helps if, if they panic and they, ha they sometimes have that I can't do maths approach to life, everybody can do maths um, and, and they become aware of their own learning as well and take ownership of that. Representing, children need time and opportunity to represent their learning in an active way. Um, so constructing models, drawing mathematical pictures, um, manipulating ideas. And then reporting, so they have to engage in meaningful maths talk. Um, so maths has to involve lots of verbal feedback and back and forth, uh, refining and consolidating. But children need to be able to talk together to, in order to, to really develop their understanding of maths. So, um, data and assessment. So in order for pupils to achieve, we need to know what they know already. So not just facts and knowledge remembered soon after teaching, um, but embedded knowledge, which they can apply in different ways. Um, and this is where purposeful and accurate data can be a great help. Um, so learning doesn't just happen. We have to make sure it's, we you know, look into what they need as individuals. And there are three tangible pieces of assessment which together make a powerful tool um, when planning for pupil progress and as a result, individual achievement. So we use CAT data, which gives an, an idea of pupil potential um, and it gives us a benchmark against national and cohort data as well. Um, and we, we gather this in, in years three, three and five and it helps us to plan for pupil progress. Um, it also helps us to see if a child is underperforming against their potential. So it's all about finding out pupil potential and that can help identify learning need or a lack of confidence where we need to stretch and challenge a little bit more. Um, but also if they're outperforming themselves, so if they're working their socks off, we can reward them and, and tell them how, how well they're doing. Um, but this data then sits alongside attainment data um, and teacher, teacher and pupil assessment to build a picture. So attainment data, um, we use Pira and Puma, so reading and maths assessments, to look specifically at knowledge and understanding. So questions are broken down into strands and they help us identify specific areas that need work. Um, so this can help us plan for individuals, but it can also help us plan for whole classes. So for example, um, in some year four data I was looking at last week, um, fraction questions were challenging for the whole cohort. Um, so we're planning to do some more fractions work, but a high percentage got the number questions right. Um, so they've been doing well with their times tables, rock stars um, and practicing that at home. Um, the same can be said for reading. So let's say Jane found questions 10 and 13 a challenge, but two and six were fine. Um, it might show that she found um, literal, literal answers in a text were easy to find, but summary and inference questions are a bit more of a challenge. 
Then to complete the picture, teacher and self-assessment are also really important. So alongside that CAT data and the attainment data, so potential and, and, and how they're doing in those assessments, it flags level of confidence. So um, how, the, how well they're understanding it and getting on on a day to day basis. Um, so we use scaffolding um, such as success criteria so that pupils can measure how they're doing. Um, so so that those are just some of the ways that, that we um, plan for pupil progress. And finally, um, as the children move through the school, it's about building independence, building independence of thought and ownership of learning and setting high expectations. Uh, it's about nurturing those innate qualities we see in abundance in our young children, um, channeling that innate curiosity and sense of adventure and awe and wonder that comes so naturally and making sure we continue to cu cultivate that from when they're two. Um, it's about building character, taking all the opportunity which comes their way um, and in prep, we know the children well and we invest in their happiness and learning wholeheartedly and in turn the children then invest in themselves and their learning. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So um, now we we'll go to the floor and if you would like to um, ask some questions of any of the presenters, um, you'll see that there's a box with a question mark somewhere on your screen and if you click on that then there's the ability to ask questions. Um, of, of the members of staff here. Um, so um, perhaps Mr Canning, um, there's a question just um, uh, um, there was a mention of the stock exchange um, and trading on the stock exchange um, and just um, there's a question about just having a bit more information about that. Yeah, so the Stock Exchange Club started as probably two, maybe even three years ago now. Um, the idea being that it was a, a device to develop children's numeracy skills while they worked collaboratively in a project. Um, but it actually, we, we developed it significantly from that. Um, having raised from investors a thousand pounds, they've now in, in enlisted the help of Charles Stanley who actually brokered the account um, and they're trading with real money in real time. Uh, the purpose of the exercise is to grow the fund, so the wealth creation is um, is nothing to be uh, concerned with, but ultimately the fund will pay for a place for a child who couldn't otherwise afford to come to Wembley. So it's virtuous circle, it's an altruistic thing to be involved with, but it really skills the children up for their futures. Uh, the one of the end games will be that by the time they're 17, they'll take some professional examinations. Um, and then, and, and, I, and again, I don't make any particular apology around this. Uh, the competition for university places is intense, particularly the competition for places around finance um, at that level. And if you can demonstrate that you've been managing a fund and you can show the day how the funds performed over several years by the time you're 17 and you've got your professional exams, I think you've got a significant step ahead of everybody else who's competing for the same place. And our purpose at Embley is exactly that. We're here to actually do what we can to pave the way for children's futures. If it means pushing the door open a crack, then that's our role. Ultimately, they'll have to walk through it um, and win the place for themselves. But the skills they get while they're here equip them with that. Uh, it's interesting. I, I've, I've told some of you in conversation before. Reported to shareholders about their investment, why he was investing in, why his fund was investing in Diageo. And he looked at me with the benign indifference of somebody who's talking to a doddery uncle and said, don't you understand, Mr. Canning, adults like to drink. Um, I think the chap had a fair point uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the, the, the fund they're managing is uh, is outperforming the market. So in, in that regard, it, it has uh, huge interest for the children. They seem really, really passionate about it. Uh, they enjoy studying uh, the performance over time. They enjoy the statistical modelling and the analysis that goes with it. Um, and it's a really good, healthy preparation while at the same time um, being a totally altruistic one. So I hope that helps with that. Um, and of course, with any of the other questions, uh, you know, a couple of them have come up. You, you're always welcome to, uh, you know, to carry on this conversation after this session is finished. But I think there's some others that I think you might want to direct to Mr. Picardo around internet security, Charlotte. Yes, yeah. Well, perhaps if I can just stay with you, Mr. Canning, because yeah, sure. um, because we've had a question around how, uh, and it, it kind of links to what you've just been saying in some ways. How are children encouraged to be critical thinkers? 
in every day in every way um, it's an intrinsic part of uh, every lesson uh, so one of the teaching and learning strategies we have is actually take children into a position where they're uncomfortable to put in front of them pieces of data and ask them to analyze it or in in well i think you probably saw in the context of the english lesson where mr o'sullivan was feeding back on it uh, to a child on a particular aspect um, the uh, that that's asking me that kind of question is an interesting one because as a philosopher by training it's my stock in trade uh, so casual conversations with the children tend to delve into that deep water immediately but it's stock in trade for everybody in the course of every lesson where children are challenged um i i think there's a couple of things coming out of um what's going on with social media certainly what's going on in news reporting and so forth that encourages all schools to take a good hard look at how they're encouraging children to be independently minded and socially aware responsible but also having a critical sense so it's intrinsic in every lesson, it's intrinsic in every teacher's interaction with the children. Uh, it's part of the natural pattern of, of teaching. Uh, you'll see it coming through in assessments. And if your children is in a public examination class, you'll see it coming through in some of the practice papers they're doing um, in preparation for the end of year assessments. Great, thank you. And um, Mr. Ricardo, if I could go to you, please. Um, mm -hmm. We've just been asked, perhaps just for a bit of clarity, mm -hmm. about um, how we manage social media and perhaps more broadly, internet safety, given our digital strategy. OK, well, inter internet safety is clearly very important to us. So there's various levels to this. So um, the, the, ac the access to web to the internet, for example, is filtered in school. So if you're accessing the internet from school, you will have to do so from your own account. So you can't access it unless you're logged in with your account. Um, there's active filters. So uh, the say, various unsavory websites are automatically blocked, but there's also some uh, keyword filtering. Uh, so for example, if a child is making searches about something that might be worrying like self-harm or um, um, th that kind of thing, then that gets flagged up to a member of staff and then that is follow up, followed up immediately. Um, every child at uh, Embley has a, a mobile device. We've chosen iPad as the platform to deliver our digital strategy. Um, the iPads are uh, managed by Embley. They're not open. They, they don't have a they don't have a uh, an app store. They have an Embley app store, which is essentially a whitelist of the apps that we've allowed um, for the children to have and we can control the iPads remotely. We use a mobile device manager if any of you are interested. Um, it's called AirWatch um, and um, all our iPad staff and students are managed in this way. That's great, thank you. Um, and perhaps more broadly, um, maybe if I go back to you, Mr Canning, we just had a question about how we deal with pupils with dyslexia. There are three um, particular approaches. One is the uh, the straightforward approach where uh, Mrs Hodge and her SEN team inform teachers of what the appropriate strategy is for any one particular child. The second uh, is in our um, professional development with colleagues looking at what's uh, best for individual children and how to cope with um, sort of the decoding and decoding and understand what goes on in children's minds around that. The third, I mean, if there are very profound cases, sometimes it's necessary to amend uh, a child's <coughs> program. I don't like because I never want to restrict uh, the access to the curriculum to any particular any child. Um, for sure, there are cases where it, it you know some children who have dyslexia find languages uh, struggle, um, and it may be in extremis we need to make that adjustment. Ultimately, it is what's best for the child. So that's how we uh, approach that. Um, I think there's, you know, how I think the question is phrased: How do you deal with pupils with dyslexia? Uh, and it's an interesting way, and it's an understandable way to phrase the question. But you, you might also want to say: How do we celebrate the students with dyslexia? Uh, because they all come with a unique set of gifts and talents, um, and uh, and and that's, you know, that idiosyncrasy is just one. A very very fondly remember a group of children uh, I, I taught, one of whom um, had some trouble with uh, dyslexia, uh, was very creative and we came up with a solution where she responded to questions um, uh, in, in the form of a, of, of a script and I thought in terms of philosophy there's lots of precedent for that, you know, Sartre and Camus got away with it uh, and, and so did she uh, to a huge extent. So that's how we do that. 
Um, I see there's also a question around sports facility suffering of not being able to uh, undertake team events and matches. Um, I, <laughs> if, if you manage to get to school a little early and see some of the practices going on, uh, I think you could say, well, I'm not entirely sure they'd suffer at all. They're hungrier than they ever were. They're learning faster bold and handling skills than they ever did. Um, it's a huge crimp in everybody's style that we're not able to uh, to compete. Um, but certainly the exercise that children are getting, the drills that they're running through, um, the interaction they're having with each other, the quality of coaching they're getting, the fact that that's been extended to the, the prep school um, and we've taken a whole school approach to bringing children on. Uh, I think that's uh, a, a more than ample compensation, but it's, it's not at all the same thing. Um, it's very difficult. You can't replicate that sense of competition, um, however much you drill and train and practice and so forth. So um, it's 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 been dented. I don't think it's suffered irreparably. And if anything, as I said, it's made these guys hungrier. Um, both girls and boys really, really keen to get back and compete. Um, there's a couple of ones, a couple of questions that have come up. One is about pigeonholing students from the outset. If we follow Yellis predictions, um, I, I think, uh, in, in, in fact, quite the opposite is the case. The Ellis prediction forms the baseline. We think actually that seems to be in a cohort what this particular candidate on that day might be likely to achieve. Um, the last set of results that we had at A level shows us that we've had actually a grade ahead of what, in their case, their Alice prediction, a grade ahead of what that prediction would have allowed. So far from actually holding us back, we actually see that as the minimum expectation and we look to to kick on. Um, it's a very, very fair question to ask about, do we genuinely have time to make all of the targeted changes that, that, uh, that uh, Jose mentioned? And the long and the short of it is, yes, absolutely we do. Uh, because the, and again, you know, teachers uh, will be looking at this back office function. Parents won't be expected to see it. Students certainly will not be expected to see it because they won't particularly need to understand it, um, but we do. And it means that you can, even in an English paper, you can actually drill down to uh, a specific paper, to a specific question to address how that child or that group of children are responding to it. Um, OK, it, 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 it's hard work, it's difficult, but um, yeah, so be it. Uh, don't make any apology for the fact that it's going to be difficult to do that, but everything, every child deserves it. Uh, there was a question about the uh, universities that children go on to, um, and they go on to uh, a, a, a vast range. I have said, um, I don't think glibly, but I have said they go to the right university for them. Um, Oxbridge isn't everything for everybody, but we have children, 45% uh, of whom would have gone on to uh, Russell Group last year. Others went overseas, uh, some to universities in uh, Germany, in China. Um, we've had children who've gone to university in the United States. So there's a, a, a vast range. Uh, but again, it's ultimately what the right university is for that particular child. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on, Charlotte? Uh, I think we've covered most of the questions, actually. Thank you. We're almost out of time. So if you want to perhaps um, give your final word. Well, that's very kind. I mean, I would touch on the fact that, you know, on the back of some of the things that we've we've just um, talked about. Um, so the, the, the testing that goes on, the Yellis and Alice stuff, yeah. If you think about it, you're testing a child at a particular moment in time on a particular day and that's that's a variable feast you know they can perform really well or they, they they may perform poorly but ultimately what i'm getting across here is the children grow and they grow at different rates and they grow at different depths and in in, the, in that process so everything we do is mindful of that child's growth in that particular you know dimension that they're in um, I've said to some of you in conversation, I said when I arrived here three years ago, uh, they were focused on individual children being their best. I'm not interested in being their best because I have no concept of what that is. And even if I did, it would be a redundant concept. But being your best is something you have control over. You have authentic ownership of how you approach work so that you can improve. And that's our focus with the children. It's guided and informed by some of the other standardized stuff. But while it's guided by it to a degree, it's not governed by it, it's not limited by it. Um, and we are ambitious for the children. Uh, I think anybody who's seen what's gone on over in this place in the last few years will be absolutely crystal that we are very ambitious for the children, but not in a crass way. 
nobody can come to Wembley and think, well, this is an academic hothouse where we're sweatboxing children through exams, um, as is the case in, 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 in some approaches, but it's not ours. Uh, everything is individualized. What I would uh, say, oh, so there was there was one question I think it just just came in around uh, results. <laughs> Um, I get you. I'm, I'm quite used to this now. But look, you know, there, there's a sense, you know, our reputations. It's like a bad smell in a lift. It, it lingers. It hangs around long after the occupants have departed the, the, the container. Um, we are now not what we were, what this place was once upon a time. Uh, the change in name was a change because there was a substantial change to how we go about our business and how we interact with children and what children achieve here. And I'm very, very proud that we are we're, we're, we're like I said, we're 130 places above the next independent school uh, in the area. In fact, I think in Hampshire. Uh, but there was one final request for me to you guys who are out there listening or enjoying uh, being entertained by the video content. Uh, if there's something you think we've not covered, if there's something you think, gosh, I really wonder what they think about one thing or the other. Let me know. You can contact me directly. You can contact Charlotte. You can contact anybody uh, on, on the team. But I'm very, very keen to continue the dialogue. Um, we're going to be coming back with more work around transition, around pastoral care, around co-curricular. We're going to come back with more work around adolescence and, and, and working with the developing understanding uh, to the extent that they can be understood, uh, the adolescent mind. So that stuff is going to be coming at you over the next few uh, weeks and months. But if there is something that's kind of an itch that you can't scratch and think, I really wish somebody was talking to us about that, then this is the format to do it. Yeah, please do let us know and we will put on one of these sessions um, and, and we'll share it with uh, with all because you, know, you, you won't be the only one. It's, it's always the case. But I, I guess for me, for now, uh, I think we've covered uh, most everything. Um, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, and I very, very much look forward to seeing you back in school. Uh, the Zoom thing was wonderful. It was, able, it was great to be able to see everybody. Um, this isn't quite so wonderful for me because I can't see you and you can't see me. Um, but it is what it is. The communication is important. Um, so as I say, for me, for now, thanks very much for tuning in. And we'll be back to you very, very soon. Enjoy your evening. Bye bye.